Hello and welcome. Thank you all for being here. I'm Silvia Dangon, Cultural Attaché at the Embassy of Colombia in the United States. We are really pleased to be part of this remarkable occasion. The magical realism of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Impact and Legacy, is an event organized by the National Endowment for the Humanities in collaboration with the Embassy of Colombia in the United States. John Parrish Peed, chairman of the NEH, will lead the conversation between writer, critical, and literary director of the Library of Congress, Maria Arana, and Colombian writer, columnist, and author of Gabo Contesta, Gabo Answers, Juan Esteban Constein. His Excellency Ambassador of Colombia to the United States, Francisco Santos Calderon, will briefly talk about his personal experience with Gabriel Garcia Marquez in his native Colombia. With no further ado, John Parrish Petty, Chairman of the NEH. Good evening. I'm John Parrish Petty, Chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and I'm also a lover of literature. I want to thank the Colombian Embassy in the United States for its continued partnership with the Humanities Endowment and supportive programs on the importance of culture to the health, and indeed the fate of cities, regions, and nations. Today is the 55th anniversary of the establishment of the National Endowment for the Humanities, a U.S. government agency tasked with funding the preservation, presenting, and interpreting of the humanities from literature to philosophy to history and law and other fields. From the presidential papers of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln to museum exhibitions about the women's suffrage movement to educational materials on Martin Luther King Jr. Our agency has awarded $6 billion in grants to ensure that our nation's past is broadly known so that it might inform and shape our present and future. Americans cannot know our place in history without knowing the history of other places. This event on Marquez is one step towards such knowledge. The Humanities Endowment is proud to welcome an international audience to tonight's discussion. In the midst of this pandemic, one of the few saving graces has been hearing stories of people rediscovering their love of books. Our favorite authors have been waiting for us on our bookshelves, at our libraries, ready to teach and comfort us once more. I came to know the country of Colombia through the novels of Marquez. I read Love in the Time of Cholera during college. The novel spoke to me immediately as a fellow Southerner, as one who was also raised in a hot land, thick with long memories and hard truths and enduring fables. The novel helped me toward to select my chosen field of literature. I'm heartened, but not surprised, by Marquez's deep admiration of the narrative style of William Faulkner, a native of my own state of Mississippi. Marquez once rode a Greyhound bus through the American South, hoping to get a glimpse of Faulkner's fabled Yachtnapatofa County. Like so many great artists, Marquez found a way to bring forth a singular creative vision while also absorbing the best of what had come before him. I wanna thank the nation of Colombia for giving the world Gabriel Garcia Marquez Every literary critic focused on the 20th century must tackle his lyrical prose and center it in the literary canon. Having sold more than 45 million copies of a single novel, 100 Years of Solitude, a masterpiece translated into at least 44 languages, his storytelling continues to beguile readers around the world. So now let me turn this event over to Ambassador Santos. Chairman Pete, thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for uh, having this conversation with two fantastic uh, writers uh, from Latin America that can talk about magical realism. And uh, this, uh, this, this, this generation of writers that created the Latin American boom of which Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a great exposure. 
couldn't have a, or couldn't be honored more by the discussion that we're going to have uh, during the next hour. Our two uh, um, panelists are Juan Esteban Costaín, Colombian from Popayán, a great writer, great columnist, uh, uh, one of my favorite columnists uh, in Colombia. And he just wrote, and I'm going only to talk about one book of our two panelists. He, he wrote a biography of Álvaro Gómez Hurtado, a leader of the Conservative Party, a man of ideas, a man that, that is so important, never was president, but uh, a man that was so important that if you want to understand what conservatism is in Colombia, you have to read uh, uh, that biography. And, and, and Maria Arana, also a great writer, prolific writer. Uh, uh, if you want to know what Bolívar is to Latin America, you have to read her biography, her biography of Bolívar, which is a, a, a fantastic uh, tour of, of, um, of his life. Um, I met Gao many, many times, but uh, I only met him once for work. I was kidnapped by Pablo Escobar, and after eight months, uh, I come out and, and Gabo said, I want to write a book, a reportage, not a novel, a reportage on, on the kidnappings. There were a few journalists that were kidnapped by Pablo Escobar, nine journalists that were, that were kidnapped, two of them <laughs> were killed, and he wanted to pressure uh, the government with that kidnapping, and he, he saw a great story, which it is. 20 years, uh, 30 years ago, uh, this story started, and he said, this is a moment in Colombian history that I need to write. And I said, no, I don't want to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of kidnappings. I don't want to know anything about it. I want to get out of here. I left, I, so I didn't participate in, in the book at the beginning. So he decided to go in another direction with another of the hostages and, uh, and, and based it on, on, on one of her, Maruja Pachon. Uh, but when I came back a year afterwards, after being in, uh, in, in Boston at the, uh, for, for a year at Harvard, he asked me, I said, look, you're critical to this book. I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. So me and my wife, because he always wanted to understand the, the, the whole dynamics of family kidnapping and how it happened. Uh, we spent hours and hours and hours, days talking about the kidnapping and what's really interesting is how detailed he was. He had a book, a notebook with colors, and every chapter had a different color. And he had colors for what he was writing from uh, for, from every uh, from every character in the in the book. He had done so much research. He found, by the way, because he when you read his books, that detail in the description is so detailed that I learned how he did it during during the writing of that book. Uh, he would ask so many little small details. What was the smell? What was the light? What was the color? Did you see his eyes? Think that, that, uh, that uh, you know, for, for a book like, like that one that ended up being news of a kidnapping, uh, you understand that at heart, what Gabriel Garcia Marquez was, is a journalist. And that's what, that, and, and that's what he always said. I am a journalist. I love journalism. I saw him firsthand. Uh, um, we had a great time uh, uh, talking about a lot of the details in the kidnapping. As I said before, he found out that my life was spared because uh, I was going to be the first one to be killed when there was an incident as a retaliation. And, uh, and, uh, and he found out that one of the sisters of a big drug kingpin found about it, talked to Escobar and say, if you kill him, we're all going to be dead. I didn't know that. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here talking to you. Uh, the guy up there uh, is protecting me. So, uh, and and after finishing with us uh, in one of the in one of the um, meetings, uh, he, I said, "Why don't we go to dinner?" And we went to dinner. We had a, a few drinks, a lot of drinks, to be very sincere. And all of a sudden, he says with me because I had been in Bogota, "Come on, let's go find the house where 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 you were kept. You know where it was." And I said, "Yes, I know the general areas where it was." And we spent the next four hours looking for the house, we couldn't find it. But, uh, but I know that if I stayed a couple more hours, we would have found the house where, where they had kept me during, during eight months. Um, Gao is part of Colombia, Gao is part of the universe, Gao is part of the world. And I'm so glad that, 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 that we're going to have this discussion about him. And please, uh, Chairman, uh, the floor is yours, the floor is uh, Mr. Constaines and Ms. Arana. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for those insightful remarks. It's my pleasure to moderate this discussion. And we, of course, if we've heard, as we have heard, we are fortunate to have two distinguished scholars and writers with us today. But before we want to uh, we hear from them, I want to give space to Marquez himself. Here is a brief video of the author reading the opening of 100 Years of Solitude. Muchos años después, frente al pelotón de fusilamiento, el coronel Aureliano Buendía había de recordar aquella tarde remota en que su padre lo llevó a conocer el hielo. Macondo era entonces una aldea de 20 casas de barro y caña brava, construidas a la orilla de un río de aguas diáfanas que se precipitaban por un lecho de piedras pulidas, blancas y enormes como huevos prehistóricos. El mundo era tan reciente que muchas cosas carecían de nombre y para mencionarlas había que señalarlas con el dedo. After those famous opening lines, Marquez introduces characters in the village, including a family of peddlers. One has a magnet that pulls pots and pans and lost metal objects from houses. Marquez writes, quote, things have a life of their own, the gypsy proclaimed with a harsh accent. It's simply a matter of waking up their souls, unquote. As readers, we find ourselves in a novel thick with the minute details of history, but also in a land of fable where inanimate objects carry their own stories. Juan, would you talk to us about the concept of magic realism and how Marquez deployed it so effectively in his fiction? Yes, sure. And uh, let me first uh, thank you, John, for the invitation. And it's a pleasure for me to be here and to share this conversation with Marie Arana, a writer and a scholar I admire so much. And I, I apologize for my English because it's a while since I haven't used it, at least publicly. But yeah, that, that concept is, is very important. Uh, the funny thing is that uh, magic realism as a concept was first coined in uh, the 1920s in Germany. It was uh, used to describe uh, the work of some painters and artists that opposed to expressionism. But uh, 20 or 30 years later, it began to be used uh, in Latin America by some critics and writers that uh, used it to uh, identify, to designate, like not only a literary movement in all our countries, in Venezuela, in Guatemala, in Colombia, in Argentina, but also uh, like a new and a different form of rationality. You know, because there has always been, or, or there has, uh, yes, there seems to be always like a clash between uh, the Western rationality and our reality, our overflowing and overwhelming and prodigious reality, and the means we have always used here in Latin America to explain that reality to the Western minds. So magic realism began to be used here in Latin America to define that new rationality. And uh, I think that coincided with an increasing interest that was emerging in, in the world and in the first world in the 50s and the 60s uh, about our uh, situation in Latin America. So that coincidence allowed our literature to, to be like an explanation, a perfect explanation of our reality. And that's why all our writers became so uh, famous and so important in Europe, in the States, to explain uh, our reality 
And in that context, obviously, uh, Garcia Marquez was a leading figure because when you think about magic realism, obviously, uh, his style, his voice, uh, his topics, his characters, all that is the perfect representation of what uh, magic realism uh, is all about. I must say that the concept uh, was very useful at the time, but eventually it became like a commercial formula as well. So now it's uh, a bit uh, devaluated. But anyway, I think it's very useful to explain and to discuss at least uh, the work and the life of all those writers back in the 60s and the 70s coming from Latin America. You touched on something I want to ask Maria about, which is unintended consequences. So as Marquez's large, as multi-generational novels found an international audience, and this drove the Latin American literary boom, did it put pressure on other writers from the hemisphere to conform to a certain style, such as magic realism, you know, to certain topics, whether that's romantic passion, revolution, agrarian life? Uh, Marie, you, you've had such a career uh, you know, in Latin America, in the United States, in, in American publishing. Talk to us about, uh, about uh, what Juan was alluding to, the, these maybe unintended consequences. Thank you for the question, uh, John. And uh, first, I want, I want to say how grateful I am that you're having this program at the National Endowment of the Humanities, a uh, great tribute to Latin American literature. And it's wonderful that you've had the collaboration of the, of the Embassy of, of Columbia in Washington, DC. Uh, I also want to say I'm a great fan of Juan Esteban's <laughs> work. Uh, so I'm very, very honored to be here uh, uh, beside him. So thank you for that. Yes, the unintended consequences were, were remarkable. You know, um, it was at, the, at once an open door because the uh, the Latin American boom followed, you know, it, and 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 in the world there was there was this great interest. Uh, you know, when when um, the book was published, it was the very year in 1967 when Miguel Angel Asturias had won the Nobel Prize. So you can imagine there was this curiosity. Nobody had heard of Asturias in the world. But uh, then comes along this tremendous, magnificent novel that sort of that that took everybody by storm, and you had um, it, it opened people to write about their own mythologies. You know, so you had Salman Rushdie writing *Midnight's Children*, uh, and you had Mo Yan in China, who was terrifically inspired by by Garcia Marquez. And you had, um, well, most close uh, alliance, I think, was with Isabel Allende, who suddenly produced this novel that was like an echo, suddenly, of, uh, of Garcia Marquez's work. At the same time, it introduced this question of, should I be writing like that? Or should, is, that, is that place taken, right? Uh, and I think the sense was for many, many people, and suddenly there was a, certainly there was a um, a reaction against it. Most famously, I think, by uh, Alberto Fuguet, who um, said, "You know, we live in we don't live in uh, those villages and those uh, yakpa patafas. Uh, we live in the urban centers, and we have garbage, and we have filth, and we have all these things that we're living with, and um, and and we are not of that breed. So it it it, it actually it opened the door for many. No, it also it, uh, it with the inspiration, of course, uh, and you had from then on, from the Latin American boom, you had Hispanic writers in the United yeah. States suddenly getting attention, which they never had had before. Um, and you had, uh, you know, a cross inspiration because you had Maxine Hong Kingston then yeah. publishing her book, Warrior Woman, which was also an echo of Garcia Marquez. But it also, I think, was um, intimidating somehow to many writers. They didn't want to fall into the same trap. Um, and I find myself, you know, I, I wrote the first sentence of my novel, Cellophane, 
and I showed the first chapter to my husband, and he said, oh, you can't do that first sentence because it sounds too much like Garcia Marquez. <laughs> <laughs> so there's an inhibiting quality to it as well. Well, when I first heard about uh, magical realism, for me, it, it was just Southern literature, the American literature we, you know, uh, of the South. We say um, it might not be fact, but it's truth. And and I and I think uh, that's what we're getting at. And um, as you know, I have a number of questions I want to ask you, and, and also videos. But but I'm going to ask uh, a question as a fan, which is I want to know right off the bat uh, from both of you, what's your favorite uh, Marquez work or favorite character, and and why? Are you Okay. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I, 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 I love all of his work. For, for first of all, I mean, uh, and and the works are so distinctive, right, in themselves. I mean, they're very, very different in themselves. Although you can recognize Garcia Marquez's voice, there's no question. You hear a sentence, a random sentence, and you know it is Garcia Marquez. Um, and so I, I love all his works, but I have a specific fondness for. Um, for love and other demons mm. and let me tell you why because i think it combines he was such a great journalist he, he had this sense of journalism uh and and in that book you you have uh the reporter is represented in the book and you have uh all of the components of of his work but um and i don't think that it's a work that gets as much intention as as others so uh, i wouldn't say i have a favorite but i'm very fond of that book for that reason <clears throat> yes, in my case, I should have um, to say 100 Years of Solitude, because it's a book I have read so many times and I love it. But I'm very fond of uh, a journalistic book, too, that is called, um, I think, uh, The Story of a, a Shipwrecked Sailor. Yeah. Uh, because it's the first book of Garcia Marquez I ever read. And it was given to me by a very clever teacher I had in Popayán. Because at the time, I hated Garcia Marquez, you know? <laughs> I, I grew up in the 80s when Garcia Marquez had just been awarded the Nobel Prize. And uh, he became the worst thing a person and an author can ever become. Uh, he became homework. And he was like an, <laughs> like an official imposition to us. And we hated him. He was a pain in the ass. And to read uh, 100 Years of Solitude and to spot all those intricacies of the book. So uh, this teacher gave me uh, this uh, chronicle, this little book of journal. It, it was a journalistic piece. And I read it secretly. like as if it were a forbidden book. And I couldn't believe my eyes. I just uh, loved the book and Garcia Marquez seduced me forever. So I am, I'm very fond of that one. Well, and I, I mentioned earlier uh, William Faulkner and, uh, and, uh, and Marquez's admiration for him. And, and of course they have so many similarities. They both wrote powerfully about the weight of history upon a people, upon a place. Uh, they wrote in a similar style, you know, those long winding complex sentences about love or violence, uh, poverty among a people of faith and, and largely rural communities, you know, as Marie pointed out, you know, that rural communities, not, not urban. And even at the conclusion of Marquez's Nobel prize speech, he cites Faulkner's rather famous uh, Nobel Prize speech. So it's a very you know, conscious uh, association. And so for both writers, a sense of place was essential. So Marie, would you just kind of bring us to a discussion about the importance of place in, in his work? Very, very important. And, and as you say, uh, Yakna Patafa uh, to Faulkner is very much like Macondo to Garcia Marquez. And, and uh, Garcia Marquez always paid tribute to, to Faulkner. 
um, and it, a reflection, you know, for, for Faulkner, it was, Yachna Patafa was Lafayette County, right? With yeah, yeah. Uh, Oxford, Mississippi. And, um, and for, for uh, Garcia Marquez, it was this small uh, town that he was had been, been bor born in, um, which is Aracataca, in which 80 kilometers or so south of, um, of Santa Marta and the coast of, of Colombia. So uh, that the the place um, was it, it it defines I think uh, almost everything that Garcia Garcia Marquez's books I think it was all like Faulkner Faulkner's novels were all except three were set in Yakna Patafa. and uh, it was the same for Garcia Marquez he had, he adopted that form and he made so much of a different world with it. I mean, it was a completely different universe. But I think this was a, this was something that um, that we recognized. It was it was almost like I think it was Homer who said, no writer is original. Yeah. We all we all wink and we steal and we wink and we steal. Right. And and one follows on the other. Um, Faulkner had a tremendous uh, influence as well on my compatriot. Um, Mario Vargas Llosa, uh, tremendous in influence on him. And I think it was, I have to credit um, with that, uh, that sense of place, which uh, Vargas Llosa didn't use about Faulkner. Garcia Marquez really did to the hilt, uh, absolutely. And I think that those um, it, it, writers who do that, Flannery O'Connor, for instance, with the South, right? Um, and and uh, we have writers, you know, who, who who specifically set their work in the jungle or in the mountain, the Sierra, and uh, that's 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 not uncommon. But to to completely focus on a place like that and to create a world as he did, um, I think, was very seductive to readers. Yeah. Yeah, Faulkner's phrase as he spoke of writing about his little postage stamp of soil, and and uh, and yet what a world is there, uh, and I think that you know we have a lot of aspiring writers listening, and I think that's important when people think, oh, I haven't seen the world, or we're in a moment we can't travel, and so much, so many of the answers are right there. You know, Juan, tell us about Latin American literature today, contemporary writers right now. Is, is Does place still matter in the same way? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not very sure. I'm not very sure about it, uh, you know, because anyway, my interests are uh, a little far from lit lit the contemporary liter Latin American literature. But I have to say that anyway, there's always a geographical dimension to literature that is important either in Latin America or wherever, you know? And, but for us in Latin America, it is even more important because uh, we were born out of a violent uh, episode, that is the conquest, and then language became a, like the healing resource we had to come to terms with our identity that came out of the conquest. So our actual um, birthplace is language uh, and is literature. So uh, when you think about all the great um, Latin American authors, you think of an imaginary place like Macondo, like Comala, Rulfos Comala, like Onetis Santa Maria. Uh, it's like the invention, the permanent invention of the world. But obviously that has changed a lot in the contemporary world. I think uh, many writers in Latin America, I don't know if it is because of the globalization or whatever, but that has changed and we got uh, fed up with uh, that mythology and geographical mythology and the interests now are very different and ha have to do 
with uh, more uh, universal aspects of life and uh, of the individual life. But it's very interesting as a discussion to, to contrast the, the contemporary uh, phenomenon and what the boom authors did to invent and create uh, those universes with their particular spaces. And I also want to bring us back to Marquez again. And here he is, he's talking about finding inspiration when he needed it most. Y escribí 100 años de soledad. Yo recuerdo que yo estaba en México escribiendo el episodio de Remedios la Bella. Yo durante casi dos años salí muy pocas veces a la calle cuando estaba escribiendo 100 años de soledad. Pero cuando estaba en esa parte, durante tres meses no salía al jardín de la casa. Toda la vida la hacía dentro de la casa. Y entonces ese día ya me consideraba fracasado tratando de que Remedios la Bella subiera al cielo, de que fuera creíble. Entonces salí al jardín como a respirar y estaba corriendo un gran viento y había una chica que lavaba en la casa que estaba tratando de prender las sábanas en el alambre y no lograba. Y la encontré envuelta en sábanas, enredada con aquellas sábanas mojadas que estaba tratando de tender a secar. Y regresé y esa fue la solución. La, 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 la puse tratando de doblar una sábana y la sábana se la llevó. A, inclusive los críticos, los críticos dicen que traté de hacer la metáfora de que, se, de que fue una vela que fue navegando con el viento, nada de eso, pero un todo mucho más fácil. En el momento en que el lector encontró las sábanas, se creyó, lo creyó, lo creí yo y lo creyeron ellos. And I mentioned uh, aspiring writers that we might have listening, and that's one reason I really wanted to have this clip in there. I think it's so essential to remember that even the greats lose confidence now and again. And I, I think, honestly, one of the most important values for a writer, it may be commitment uh, more than talent, or at least in addition to talent. And so, Marie, you, you know very well the importance of commitment for a writer. You're the author of a biography, a memoir, award-winning novels, a book on the craft of writing. Um, and for your day job, you work with hundreds of authors uh, for the world's largest library, the Library of Congress. You just finished the National Book Festival, uh, which was a wonderful success. Uh, so talk to us about the writing life, especially in our age, as English language publishers are moving away from, from publishing works of literature, for example. It's, it's a very interesting question, John, because, you know, um, the, the publishing industry, at least in, in this country, in the United States of America, um, has grown, has, has ballooned. It, it was $115 billion in um, 2015, and it's uh, $125 billion in 2020. So it's something that's growing. At the same time, the interest in, the, in, in, in literature, in literary works, is decreasing, uh, and, the, and the attention to translation is minimal. So uh, you have this ballooning uh, uh, great pool of opportunity. But the readers are, are uh, largely, if you look at the, at the numbers, they're largely a crime fiction, thrillers, romance, that sort of thing. And the, and the literary world is actually holding its own, but it's not growing uh, in any way. And it's, it, it's, it's fantastic when somebody bursts that bubble, right? And somebody comes forward, like suddenly Bolaño was uh, popular and it was out of the blue. How did uh, Roberto Bolaño become so popular? Just pulled out of, of, of um, you, you know, his, his grave practically to, to, to fame. So the, the, um, the commitment to literature, I think is, um, it's there, you see it in, I see it in, in publishing houses like Riverhead, for instance, which is a, 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 an imprint of Penguin Random House, which devotes itself to translations and, and to works of, of uh, writers that are really interesting from Russia, from Serbia, from Latin America, from, uh, from, from many places. And, and it's, it's quite wonderful to see when that happens and when they are successful at it. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a hard business, I think, for people who, who are really seriously inter interested in uh, the literary arts. 
And I'm so glad, by the way, that you mentioned literary translators uh, because they're so essential. And Marquez had two great translators you know, at a minimum uh, into uh, American publishing. Uh, Rabassa and Grossman are both so wonderful. And indeed, uh, President George W. Bush uh, awarded the Medal of Arts uh, to Rabassa. I was at the White House when that happened. I work at the National Endowment for the Arts. And it was so wonderful to see uh, our country affirming that, that endeavor. And um, we, we all three know wonderful writers who haven't quite made, haven't found their audience for the lack of a translator, and which is such a selfless, selfless endeavor. Um, so, so Juan, you've been uh, named uh, one of the finest uh, young writers in Latin America, uh, and you distinguish yourself uh, in long and short form. And so talk to us about those traits um, that you find most necessary uh, as a writer. And also, um, have you learned as a writer from Marquez's example? Well, uh, I, I like to just slip a little anecdote of a friend of mine in England who once told me, there's uh, the author of 100 Years of Solitude. And I asked him, who? I was expecting, obviously, Garcia Marquez to see Garcia Marquez, and it was Rabasa. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> and he was actually. But uh, I think there's a beautiful lesson to be learned uh, from Garcia Marquez, obviously, apart from uh, his wordcraft and the beauty of his prose and his voice and all of that. But he uh, devoted himself entirely to literature, even before 100 years of solitude. Yes. And that's uh, fantastic. And that's quite moving because he decided since the beginning that he would be nothing but a writer. Since he began to write in 1947, he said, I'm going to be a writer and nothing but a writer. And he dedicated himself entirely to that aim. And he succeeded. But that's a fantastic lesson because uh, when he was in Mexico, uh, he was well off. He had a good job before writing 100 Years of Solitude. He could have not written. He could have never written the book, but he left everything and he committed himself to the purpose of writing, uh, of writing that uh, wonderful book. And um, rather than, or more than writing a book, he was like performing a miracle. And he knew he was into something very, very big. And that's uh, moving and inspiring. And our discussion of the writer's life is a per perfect segue into the next video. And here's Marquez. It's on the occasion of, of the Nobel Prize being awarded to him. And he's discussing the importance of solitude for a writer. Creo que mi, toda mi vida y toda mi obra se me ha ido tratando de explicarme, de contestarme a mí mismo esta pregunta. ¿Qué es la soledad? En realidad... Se habla de la soledad del poder, de la soledad del corredor de fondo, de la soledad del escritor. Se habla de la soledad de cada uno. Casi puede uno sospechar que lo que pasa es que todos, absolutamente todos, estamos solos. En algún momento yo lo vislumbré como el contrario de la solidaridad. Sin embargo, creo que es bastante más profundo y más complejo. Lo que pasa es que si yo llego a descifrarlo, probablemente no vuelva a escribir porque precisamente yo escribo es para tratar de saber qué es la soledad. Por consiguiente, prefiero no saberlo y seguir escribiendo todavía mucho tiempo. One of the reasons the government of Colombia and the Humanities Endowment launched this, this program, what we're doing tonight, and, and another program we did together, is because we believe in the importance of cultural exchanges, we believe in the importance of the creative economy. Artistic creation is never bound by mere geography, of course, never bound by historic time period or societal differences. Art is universal. 
Take, for example, Marquez's discussion of solitude we just heard. He is tapping into a conversation, of course, that has been going on for thousands of years, as long as the written record exists. I, 200 years ago, I, uh, for example, William Wordsworth, the great British poet, was talking about poetry. And he said, and I'll quote, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotion recollected in tranquility. That last phrase has really become a famous one for describing poetry. And then an, an, another quote by Faulkner, which uh, usually my staff has me dial down the Faulkner. I think they just gave up on me, but I'm gonna use another <laughs> quote from Faulkner, if you'll forgive me. Faulkner said uh, at one point, writing is a solitary job. That is, no one can help you with it, but there's nothing lonely about it. It's simply solitary. I think there is a difference between loneliness and solitude. And of course, here he's a little bit different interpretation than Marquez. So Marie and Juan, I'll ask you both, I'll open up the floor. How important is solitude to the writer's craft? This is a, a, an important distinction in language itself and the problem of translation, right? Because soledad, and which in, in Portuguese would be saudade, um, and, and solitude are just not the same. They're not the same words, they're not the same feeling. Um, and, and I think what Garcia Marquez says in that quote is so phenomenal because he, he actually links it for us, for, for English language speakers, because he says aloneness and loneliness. And that is the combination of aloneness and loneliness is soledad. So um, uh, it's, 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 it's always been interesting to me because you know, you, you're born alone, you die alone, you read alone, you write alone. And so the act of writing is at once, you know, the, the solitude of, of writing is at once a torment and a necessity, right? Uh, a torment because you really need to be out listening to people or being inspired by what you see or being connected to the world. At the same time, um, a necessity because you have to get to your desk and you have to be alone and you do this act like very few acts in your life, utterly alone. And um, I think that's just a brilliant quote on the, on the part of, of Garcia Marquez because it speaks so much to what we all as writers do. I mean, and, and when you talk about aloneness and loneliness, so many writers um, like, like me uh, have left their, their countries to do writing elsewhere, right? And, and put themselves in, in this situation. I know Juan Esteban writes in Berlin sometimes, right? And you put yourself in this strange dislocation in which you are truly culturally alone almost. And um, that it was really useful to Garcia Marquez. It was really useful to Mario Vargas Llosa. It is useful to so many people, to writers to extract themselves and even intensify the solitude a little bit. So it, it's, a, it's a really important passage and speaks to us all as writers. Juan, what's a, what's a solitude like for you in Berlin versus in your home country? Well, uh, uh, I'm, uh, it's stronger here in my own country <laughs> than uh, in Berlin. Because in Berlin, I'm always with uh, my two daughters, so I haven't got so much time to write. Yeah. But uh, I remember that Garcia Marquez always, uh, he used to say that his whole work was a long poetical reflection on solitude. And um, it is true, but it, it is a long reflection to on the isolation of fame and glory. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Because obviously 100 years of solitude was a turning point in his life. But I once met um, Carmen Mutis, the wife of uh, Alvaro Mutis, uh, who was maybe Garcia Marquez's best friend and a great writer and poet in his own right. And they, Carmen and Álvaro Mutis, lived in Mexico. It was them who persuaded García Márquez to move to Mexico in 1959, 1960. 
And when he was writing 100 Years of Solitude, Carmen told me, uh, they would visit Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Mercedes every day, almost every day, to spend the evening with them. And one day they arrived a little earlier and Garcia Marquez was still in his studio, in his room, writing, working. And Carmen told me, it the only thing you could hear was the music of uh, the type writer, the music of that language reverberating in the hands of this magician. And since he was always sm smoking in there, the smoke of the cigarettes uh, um, slid beneath the door, and it came out. It uh, it, it was it, it came out in fumes, you know, uh, under uh, the um, door slit. It came out, and Carmen told me it was as if a big fire uh, were uh, burning yeah. in there. And it was, because uh, Garcia Marquez was burning into ashes the whole world to reinvent it anew. And, and that's a beautiful image of what solitude uh, can do for a writer. <laughs> wonderful. Uh, oh, that's, that's a wonderful framing of it, uh, like a dragon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll open a, a, a question to both of you, and, and you both touched on it a bit, uh, particularly Juan, your remarks. So, Mark has that rare ability to be a prolific writer as well as a public intellectual. Uh, he had the personality for it, the energy for it. Um, he was very politically active, and frankly, not always a fan of US foreign policy, you know, to put it mildly. Um, do you think his literary work suffered from these activities, from their demands on the time, on his time, or do you think it also broadened his points of reference? From my point of view, I think it it, it certainly didn't suffer. I think it may have broadened I, uh, his whole view. I remember very well when he was uh, when he went and bought a house in in Havana, in La Havana. And um, everybody was so critical, and, and it hampered him in the sense that he couldn't get into the United States. The United States yeah. gave him a lot of trouble, didn't allow him in. He was uh, branded as a communist. And his rationale was always, well, you know, how insane is it not to talk to somebody who is in power and whom you may not believe in what? he believes in, you may not have the same ideology, but how insane is it to, to actually, you know, push them away and not know who they are and not understand who they are? Well, uh, you know, uh, the, the great curiosity that he showed in, in Autumn of the Patriarch and in other places, that, that um, obsession that he had with the tendency, the Latin American tendency to dictatorship, and it was um, Garcia Marquez when he was working on the on his own novel about Simon Bolivar, uh, was fascinated by the whole business uh, and the whole truck of power uh, and how how uh, people dealt with it and how it consumed you and how fame and and sometimes power corrupted you completely. And so it, uh, I, I think it was that um, that association with with uh, Fidel that marked him for sure in the world, but I don't think it necessarily marked his work. Um, oh, Juan may disagree with me, but I, it, I didn't see that. No, I don't disagree with you at all. Uh, I think that um, Garcia Marquez was obviously a very. Uh, politically committed uh, intellectual and author. And as Marie says, uh, power was one of his most uh, fruitful and recurring obsessions, you know? Uh, but I think that he never uh, instrumentalized his ideology in his literary work, never, ever. He never used uh, his novels to express a political 
or an ideological agenda at all. He uh, traced the boundary quite clearly. Uh, and that's why his work is uh, so beautiful. Uh, but uh, obviously, when you've got an, an author, uh, we readers, we look for everything an author is, including his political ideas. Right. His worldview will be present always in his work, but he never instrumentalized his ideology in his uh, works. Uh, and Maria, I'll just continue that conversation. Uh, Eudora Welty wrote a, a really fun essay that I reread in last month, and it really hands, stands up. And she asked, must the writer crusade? And she answered no, and, and, and uh, for herself, um, though in many ways her fiction spoke about, uh, about equality, about uh, any number of responsibilities of government to its community uh, quite powerfully. So um, what is your point of view? Sh should a writer be political? And if a writer is political, should we agree with those views merely because we love their literary work? Well, I, I think you can't get away from the political in certain cases, right? I mean, even if it is just uh, Yakta Patafa and, uh, or, or the big world, you can't, you can't really get away. And there are people who do use it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, a, a novel or fiction is necessarily a platform for politics, but I think pe there are people who use it and use it to good effect. Uh, I, you know, when I think of Philip Roth, uh, Philip Roth used politics every time he wrote a book. I mean, it was very much there. Um, and you can see it uh, in, in, in writers in the United States, Louis Zerdrich, uh, Norman Mailer, all of these people who use, to some extent, the political world that we live in. Um, it's not n necessary. I think sometimes uh, writers anticipate it in ways, I'm, I'm thinking now of Colson Whitehead, who, who just won the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction, who started a book many, many years ago uh, about the Underground Railroad, the, 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 the escape to freedom of the slaves from the South to the North. Um, he didn't anticipate that we would suddenly be in a, a, a place in the United States of America where we're having a, a reckoning with race and we're thinking about Black Lives Matter. But somehow, boom! It fits, you know, and it it it, it catches the uh, the wind of uh, the political wind. Uh, I don't think that's a writer's job, yeah. but sometimes it's it's there and it happens, and people sail on that particular um, wind. Yeah, it, and and sometimes I, I think many times, frankly, the work of fiction is stronger than nonfiction. I think of in the time of the butterflies. Yes. We, think about the power of that for indicting uh, corruption, uh, you know, um, in a powerful way. Uh, I'm starting to have people give me a sense of the time. Uh, and what we want to do now is we're going to have our final video. And, and this is about three and a half minutes. And again, it's from the, the larger interview after uh, Marquez's uh, Nobel Prize. And here he's talking in, in, in detail. That's why we want to let it go on, talking about the process of writing his books. So we'll have this video, then a few last questions, and then I'm going to say a summing up and, and express my gratitude. So we'll play the video. ¿Cuál es el proceso de creación de un libro? El punto de partida para hacer un libro. Sí, yo imagino que para cada escritor es distinto. Yo entiendo que algunos escritores parten de un concepto, parten de una idea. Yo en realidad parto de una imagen. Lo primero que a mí se me ocurre de un libro es una imagen. Por supuesto se me ocurren muchas imágenes casi, digamos, al día. Pero hay algunas que persisten más que otras. Y a mí las que van sobreviviendo son las que voy las que voy manteniendo y elaborando y alrededor de ellas voy explorando todo el contorno hasta que llega un momento en que, en que tengo el libro completo, como si ya lo hubiera leído. Es decir, que cuando yo me siento en la máquina voy es prácticamente a copiar lo que ya tengo mentalmente, mentalmente resuelto. Y casi siempre, casi siempre se ajusta bastante el libro terminado al libro mental, digamos. Eh, 
pocas veces, pocas veces se me ha, se me ha desviado un libro de, del programa original. Esto, por supuesto, necesita, necesita mucho rigor. Durante la época en que estoy pensando el libro, estoy leyendo, da la impresión de que no hiciera nada, da la impresión de que estuviera muy de vago. Pero en realidad estoy trabajando duramente en la preparación del libro. Cuando ya lo tengo, entonces empieza la parte que no es la más divertida, que es el de escribirlo. Yo escribo todos los días de 9 de la mañana a 2 y media de la tarde, que es un horario que me impuso el colegio de mis hijos. Es decir, yo estaba acostumbrado, cuando ellos iban al colegio, yo me sentaba a escribir y cuando regresaban del colegio ya era la hora, la hora de comer, eso me servía a mí de, de guía. El promedio de trabajo, es, 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 son, son horas de una gran concentración, una concentración total. Porque además tengo organizada ya la casa, que hasta ahora no pasan llamadas telefónicas, no hay interrupciones de ninguna clase. A pesar de que no tengo mucho la, toda esa mitología de los escritores que necesita silencio, un ambiente especial, no necesito sencillamente que no me interrumpan para, para poder seguir pensando. En esas horas... En un buen día de trabajo, de literatura, hago una cuartilla, a dos espacios. A excepción del Otoño del Patriarca, que fue un, un libro particularmente arduo, y me sentía satisfecho cuando, tenía, cuando se lograba hacer un párrafo. Entonces, párrafo por párrafo, trabajando todos los días con interrupciones, porque el libro se me perdió en una época, no tenía la menor idea por dónde iba, y era que estaba escribiéndolo en Barcelona, y tuve que volver al Caribe que fue cuando dije que venía, porque se me estaba olvidando cómo era el olor de la guayaba, que ha quedado ya como un símbolo de, en Colombia se repite con mucha frecuencia, que el olor de la guayaba es, es Colombia, ¿no? Para mí es el Caribe en general. Bueno, salvo el otoño del patriarca de todas esas interrupciones, los demás, una cuartilla diaria, es un buen promedio. Y el otoño del patriarca por eso muere siete años en el... It's so wonderful to hear his voice. Uh, I had the very unpopular duty of, of giving you a one last question and, uh, and any answer you want to speak to, frankly, or any questions you might have for one another. But, but Marie, I, I think I would just ask you what uh, Marquez winning the Nobel Prize, what, what did that mean to you as a Peruvian American writer? And also, we haven't had a chance to talk much about your role at the Library of Congress, but I would be remiss if I didn't say that they had uh, him speak and have wonderful archival tapes and, and continue that commitment to international writers and, and how could they not with, with your important vision there and Dr. Hayden leading the library. So, but, but give us a sense of that moment, just what did it mean for you to have him so honored and of course Losa Later. Well, it's, it's extraordinary, right? I mean, it's extraordinary every time somebody from Latin America wins a Nobel Prize. It's happened so few times. Uh, in 1945, it was um, Gabriela Mistral, uh, and then came uh, Miguel Ángel Asturias, and then came Pablo Neruda. Uh, they were all from different countries. Uh, and then, of course, came came Gabo, and it was it was a tremendous um, sort of reaffirmation that oh, finally we get some eyes on us. And I think yeah. for writers uh, throughout Latin America, there was a sense that first of all, to the public, it was oh, great, we can read a Nobel Prize winner in our language, right? Which yeah. was which was a, a remarkable thing in itself, but because it happens so seldom. But uh, but also that sense that. Um, you know, the, uh, that old adage that you, if you walk in, if something makes you walk into a bookstore, uh, it may be a very popular book that has nothing to do with your book um, or your thesis or your, or your writer's heart. But there is that, the, the moment somebody walks into a bookstore, there is that opportunity that your book will get some light on it and some shine on it. So I think there was that sense, I think, among writers that, oh, 
Um, and then there was also the, the, the reverberations. It, it was, you know, like, why him? And not, you know, and, and they didn't give one to Borges? What? what? So, you know, there was, <laughs> there yeah. was a sense of that as well. And I want to thank you for mentioning uh, the Library of Congress, where, where I'm a literary director. Um, the, uh, the fantastic program that preserves those voices and that voice of, of uh, Garcia Marquez is so inimitable. It's just absolutely so so clear, so perfect. There are a few readers who can read their work that perfectly, yeah. but certainly he, he can. He always said he meant to mesmerize when he wrote and his voice does that for us. But it's a, um, it's, it, it has been called the um, very unattractive name of the Alot, which is the American Hispanic literary literature um, uh, uh, archive of Latin American literature. And it is now being changed. So the name is now Palabra, which is very, very simple and very yeah. good. But it, yeah. it, has, uh, it has these voices and these tapings that have been done since 1943. So you have Borges. You have uh, you have Octavio Paz. You have uh, you have so many wonderful wonderful writers, and including in Portuguese and in French, in Quechua, in Aymara, in Basque. So it's a, it's a wonderful collection, and I, I encourage people to go in and listen to these voices. They're magnificent. Thank you, John. Thank you. And and Juan, you alluded to uh, Marquez's assignment when you're a student, and how that feels. Uh, now you're in a different place in your career. You're a writer. Uh, your work is, is established and well known. So, talk to me about um, is that the difference between the influence and the burden of influence? And and I wonder as you think of what he means to you, if you have that burden of influence. Well, yes. I think in my I belong to a generation in which uh, the presence and the influence and the name of Garcia Marquez uh, didn't mean a harmful shadow anymore, you know, because maybe his contemporaries and the writers that came right after him, many of them had this unfair feeling that Garcia Marquez had taken away from them the glory and the fame they deserved, which they didn't, by the way. <laughs> I don't mean to be nasty, but when you compare the, him to them, it was him who had what it takes to excel and succeed. But it is always said in, in literature that you have to kill your father, but not your grandfather. So <laughs> Garcia Marquez was more of a grandfather to us than a father. So we didn't have to kill him. <laughs> and we admire him and we love him and uh, uh, for me it's one of my favorite writers so I'm very thankful to him uh, for his influence. Thank you what a great note to end on uh, so, so thank you and and I want to say Ambassador Santos, Marie, Juan, Silvia I want to thank each of you for this truly enlightening conversation also, a special thank you to our sign language and bilingual interpreters this evening. Thank you. I also want to thank President Duque and my colleague Carlos Diaz Rosilla for uniting the people of Colombia and the United States through joint cultural programming. So, so thank you. I'm sure I'm not the only one here who will read and reread Marquez's words with a deeper appreciation, a deeper perspective because of the point you have raised tonight. So I wanna thank uh, our, our panelists for sharing your time, your passion, your wealth of knowledge with us. We're grateful too for the enthusiasm and the participation of thousands of audience members who have joined us tonight from around the globe. We may lament ways in which this pandemic has limited our access to cultural spaces to satisfy our hunger for art, literature and ideas, but to see so many people come together to commune with one another over a shared love of the humanities, a shared love of literature is genuinely inspiring. So thank you. Thank you, each of you. And good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.